I mean, so here's here's you know just a vendor's picture of what an MRI machine looks like. Okay, yeah, I was in one of those once. Um, okay. And there are pictures of brains, obviously, schematics of brains, images of brains. <laughs> Sneeze guard for zombies. <laughs> Sorry. <I didn't. laughs> What platform is this? Uh, so this is just what comes off the scanner, basically. This would be on the, on the scanner workstation. I, mean, can you... I can send you this, too. I understand these are not actually the nerve bundles, but uh, the, the pathways of fluid in between those bundles. Yeah, so it represents yeah it represents the bundling of, of, of the pathways. It's not the the actual condo, It's not the actual axon itself, but it just shows that th this is the direction that the water you know can, will travel most easily is up and down this these tracks effectively. Reminds me of veins and arteries. Yeah. Uh, are they veins and arteries? There are veins and arteries, but they don't they don't follow this this path basically, okay. right. right? There are veins and arteries in the brain, but they're not affected in the ALS. So this um, is the ALS pathway. Yeah. Well, that's now. See, it's getting weirder now. Cause I thought it might be something that goes in the fluid and just flows along. Yeah, it doesn't flow along, but th once again, the, it the, moves. The, it mo it, these are the. This is the direction that it can move, that water can move most freely within this region, up and down this way. It can go this direction as well, but just not as easily. So, preferentially, um, the, the, this, this is the pathway that, that once again, this represents the, the wiring of the brain uh, in this region. So why don't you show me some pictures of some of the stuff that you've done? Maybe that'll give us some ideas. Okay. Nothing. Right. Nothing medical. No, that's fine. Okay. Let me go to different types of molecules or different types of chemicals, and one of the chemicals that we've looked at uniquely at University of Michigan is this chemical called GABA, mm -hmm. which is um, gamma butyric acid, and so it's a measure of this important chemical that kind of regulates the brain. If you, if you, it's important to regulate that brain to make sure it doesn't act too, um, basically doesn't fire too much so that you don't have sustained activity which can be da damaging. So mm -hmm. we're able to look at this uh, molecule. We call it uh, epileptics. Yeah, so like seizures, yeah, you get too much activity, the okay. brain continues to fire, it doesn't shut itself off. And then this is a schematic of, of what this molecule is. We don't see this, this is just kind of a cartoon version of what, mm -hmm. of what GABA looks like with mm -hmm. the different types of, of, um, of compounds. Carbon? Yeah, so these the, yeah, are very good. So the dark, the kind of light greenish, those are the carbons. Okay. And then the white are the hydrogen ions. Right. And then the red are the, um, the uh, nitrogen ions. Hmm. 
I would be well. Yeah, I, I didn't think the body would absorb that uh, any amount of nitrogen. I heard it was inert gas and doesn't really do anything. Well, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't absorb nit the nitrogen, but there are there are kind of proteins in the body that this does does have have nitrogen in it. Mm. Um, so the other thing I was talking about is that we can look at the connections in the brain. So here we're able to use the the kind of the properties of the water. So if I take, you know, take a theoretical piece of a small molecule, you have your three different axes, X, Y, Z, and that this can move in all three directions equivalently, so you can end up with a sphere. Mm -hmm. As things become more constrained, say if you put a molecule in an area and you had a box around it, it starts to become more constrained and it becomes more ellipsoid. So we can measure these properties using MRI. And now we can start to look at these kind of white matter tracks. So here we have, once again, a brain. This is color coded. So this shows us the direction of basically how the wiring is. So this red mm -hmm. kind of goes in and out like this direction. Mm -hmm. And then the blue go up and down. So basically we have the, you know, basically the Y axis. And then we have whatever the Z axis, I would say. Mm -hmm. And so these are very important tracks. So these connect the motor neurons which sit in this part of the brain and then they go down to the brain and then they connect to the cerebral spine. So we can start to look at alterations or uh, damage to these certain types of tracks in does, ALS. Does ALS vary from patient to patient to the point where you can measure the differences in the brain from a different patient? Yeah, it's a very good question. So all patients are probably affected slightly differently. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to get enough data from a single patient to specifically say how things are different from one patient to another. That is one of the things we're trying to figure out is how, how do we, effectively what we're trying to do with this imaging is almost develop a, a fingerprint, right? Everybody has a unique fingerprint. And so if we can capture enough of this data, perhaps we can make a unique fingerprint for that patient. But right now, you know, we, we've got a long ways to go. <laughs> wow. But that is one of the things we want to do is, is try to, you know, create, create a specific um, painting effectively for every patient we see. So you're does, more, that, does that make sense? And just enough. Uh, you're, you're basically your diagnosis, not treatment yet. Yeah, so we're, we're a diagnosis. But also with, with, with some of these techniques, we're able to figure out that, in fact, there are these changes in the brain which we've suspected, and we can see this in you know, in the, in the cellular models in the, in, or in the animals. But it's really hard to figure out what's going on in a patient because you can't, especially in neuroradiology, you can't cut a patient open and take a sample of their brain, right? Because it's, it would hurt them. So we find the imaging is very important because we can do this on living patients and figure out what's going on without using an invasive process, right? Okay. I can see what someone might say, no. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be cut up either. So, so here's another example of using kind of this special MR imaging technique, and we can start to measure the tracks in the spinal cord. So this is a spinal cord coming down, right? So as I said, if you think about it, here's what we get from a standard image. Once again, cutting through the nose, I can see, the, I can see this spinal cord, right? So this is one of Dr. Feldman's uh, stem cell patient. So she was basically uh, removing the bone. Th these are all bones back here. And then they were injecting spinal cord stem cells. I'm sorry, not spinal cord, but stem cells into the spinal cords of these patients. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to tag on this special imaging technique to look at the effects of these spinal cords or the effect of the stem cells. And we could start to track these changes. We're looking to track these changes in the integrity or the covering of these, this wiring in the spinal cord. And so this is just a pictorial example of how the kind of the wires go up and down okay. in the cervical spine. Those are specifically nerve fibers, right? These are specifically nerve fibers, now right? Now that mitochondrial dysfunction thing you showed me earlier, mm -hmm. that's where the disease travel through or is affecting that's considered just one of the different possibilities. So I know we focus I was on warning, this. I was wondering if the stem cell replacement of nerves mm -hmm. would 
disrupt the transmission of the disease through that area. Yeah, so once again, the, the idea with the stem cells is that basically the stem cells will secrete or produce kind of a, an environment that's healthy for the cells and try to counteract. It can't replace this mitochondrial dysfunction, but perhaps it gives the, ner the motor neuron enough nutrients to help protect it. So you, you can't cure the disease, but maybe you can help um, lessen the burden of these different disease processes. So yeah, so once again we have this motor neuron that sits either in the brain or the spinal cord and then it sends this kind of wiring down. So this is what we're looking at. We're looking at this wiring um, using this special MR imaging technique and that's what these pictures show you, this pictorial example. So this is not the scale. So these, you know, these go down, you know, several feet basically or all the, length, all the way to the length of the spinal cord depending on you know whether or not it comes out your feet or if it comes out your arm or whatever mm -hmm. so this is what we're looking at is the kind of the wiring of these nerve cells so i haven't been to, to one of these uh functions before with the auctions sure i was wondering what kind of people are what kind of people professionally are bidding on these works Nice, the, nice, the, the, nice, nice people. Hopefully, rich people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> generous people. Right. <laughs> I've been hunting them all my life. Yes. <laughs> so it, you know, it's a mix of folks. So there's the artists come, the uh, physician scientists from the Taubman Institute come, and then there's you know a variety of people from the Detroit area that uh, that come as well. And you know, it's it's kind of friends of the Taubman Institute, friends of the university, people that are specifically interested in certain types of diseases such as such as ALS. So it's a, it's a mix of folks. Okay. And then um, we can talk some more but after we're done here obviously but just to kind of finish up the pictures you know one of the other things we can look at is is we can target certain specific disease mechanisms. So this is another molecule that we can use and we can start to this is a PET study so PET people think mainly in terms of diagnosing different types of cancers, but we can also use PET to look at different types of disease processes in the brain as well. So this is a special type of, of a tracer, a PET tracer, and now we can start to look at inflammation in the brain. And when people think about inflammation, they usually think about multiple sclerosis, but there's also good evidence to suggest that inflammation is also involved in ALS, and so the brighter, the, the lighter green area. AC is. That's a healthy control patient. So we, ALS. ALS is an ALS patient. So I'm not seeing much of a difference here. Yeah, so this is a small number of patients. So the brighter things are, the more activity they have. So in these frontal areas, you see a little bit more brighter area than you do uh, in the healthy control. So it, it doesn't stand out so much. This is a relatively small number of patients. But if we actually do numbers, we can start to see more definitive changes uh, in these areas, and that includes where the motor neurons uh, lie. So once again, the pictures are nice just for a graphical depiction, and it looks pretty, but we really concentrate on the numbers for this to really make sense of what's going on. If I had more numbers of patients, it would be more distinctive. See, I don't know what's going on. He with that way and his camera is pointing away yeah no I, th I think he's he's, uh, he's 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 doing off and on with some of this stuff but uh, that's fine okay Cause I was what I wanted to get to the idea is if we do a what is the most what is the point of contention with you in this where your focus is the, is the greatest right now right now and I want to see if that would translate into anything that uh, a potential buyer would appreciate sure so I would say you know the main the main things that I'm looking at is once again using these advanced imaging techniques to look at the brain in these patients and I'm looking for disease processes in the brain that we can basically target so this is one of the things we could potentially do a treatment for right we could give them a medicine that would decrease the inflammatory changes in the brain of ALS patients. And we could track it with this sort of technique. So we're trying to develop new targets or new opportunities for us to go in there with a treatment in order to basically downregulate the disease process and hopefully treat patients. So this is one of my main focuses. 
is to use this type of uh, pet tracer to treat. The other focus is to use these different MRI techniques in order to come up with an earlier diagnosis for the disease because some of these patients will come in and they've had symptoms for over a year and we're not able to understand what's going on. Once again, because there's no gross structural change in that MRI to help us make a diagnosis, but the idea is if we can use these new techniques, then we can come in there and, 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 and use these, these better new techniques to make an earlier diagnosis and hopefully treat the disease earlier. Uh, early detection is a big deal? Early detection is a big deal, right. So, um, you know, once again, it's a con trying to use a combination of these different types of imaging techniques. And this has become more and more uh, mainstream, I would say, in the last year, that people are understanding that it's going to take multiple different types of tests in ALS, both to make an early diagnosis as well as try to predict how these patients are going to do. As I said, some patients, you know, they're, they're going to live for maybe 10 years, but some patients are going to die in less than two years. You get a family coming in with a, uh, and, their, and their loved one coming in, and they don't know. They come and see us and say, you know, what's my life going to be like in two or three years? And it's really hard to answer that question. So, <clears throat> you know, if you ask me what my main focus is, is, is to use these new types of techniques, these new imaging techniques, both from the MRI and the PET, in order to, um, you know, provide an earlier diagnosis, give them an idea of, of how that disease is going to progress, as well as being able to say, you know, are, are there new ways to treat this disease? Can we look at this disease differently? And can we monitor um, these, you know, as we study these new treatments, can we monitor them using an imaging technique such as this PET technique, which I've talked about? Mm -hmm. You got a little layman's write-up on PET technique? Yeah, I can send you something. Okay, that and visuals like this? Yeah, yeah I can, I'll send you the slides and stuff okay. like that. What about the MRI one? Yeah, I can, I can do that. I can send you that. And I'll, I'll send you this. I'll send you this, uh, this presentation. I have to do that because I think that would be helpful too. Yeah, because you're into, uh, you're into uh, close observation and diagnosis. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I don't want to just throw up a neuron, paint a picture of a neuron with a little arrow stabbing right. in. It's got to be some sort of pathology, pathology like from one step to another in a process or... Right, yeah, like a, like, yeah, exactly, that would be good, like, um, like a pathway kind of thing, right, to go from one, one area to the next. If it can be done second. sequentially, I'm not sure, but... Sometimes in a single frame of a painting, it, before and after can be suggested, if there is a before and after in, inherent in the process. The right. colors are nice, but I don't think the color coding is universal, you know. Exactly. And this is just an example of some of the raw data we get to look at the wiring of the brain. Yeah. And once again, these different colors represent different different ways that the water motion is happening within the brain. Water motion means fluids? Yeah, fluids basically. And once again, this is um, to give you a, an idea, I'll show you a, kind of a yeah, those schematic. Those are effect. slices. Yeah, these so, are just... So nothing in there is actually moving like that? No, nope, these okay. are just, I'm just going up and down the brain basically. Okay. And I can send you this too. Um, I have a slide that gives you kind of a better understanding of how that works. There's ways is, is this a normal control brain or is that yeah, that's, that's a healthy brain? Uh, and it's hard to tell the difference in ASA. Yeah, exactly. From from one from one person to the next. So yeah, so so here's kind of a schematic of how this works. Once again, this is this is the axon. So it's like cutting. You have this wire. We call it the axon, right? Mm -hmm. You have the nerve cell. You have this connection down here, and then we have this. this we call it a myelin sheath. This is the insulating properties of that. And basically, the water can go kind of in and out of the plane quite easily. So it can go up and down this direction very easily. But it can't go, it can't go this, you know, it can't go through this sheath so easily. So this gives you a sense that there's directionality within that area of the brain. And so it uses that information to basically generate these kind of 
kind of wiring or structures. And this, this is just another example of the cortical spinal tracts which connect the motor cortex down into the brain stem. So, um, you know, that's, that's how that runs. So, um, you know, once again, these imaging techniques have, a lot of these have been around for a while. More and more, we have a better understanding of how, how the brain is affected. You know, probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people would say it's just one specific area in the brain that's affected. But we now know that ALS affects many different areas of the brain that weren't previously recognized. And they understand that it's not just, you know, one single area in the brain that's affected, but it, it affects many different parts of the brain. And the conduit is these pathways. Is, is there a conduit? Yeah, so that's example. That's, uh, that's another important area of, of research is trying to figure out there is spread. So How it spreads. How it spreads is, is less clear, but it's very possible it could spread along these tracks. Uh -huh. But, you know, for people do know that, and once again, this is a variable disease, so in some people, you know, disease could start in this area, and other people, other people it could start in this area, it could start down in here, but they do know that there is spread of that disease over time. And you say there's no correlation between um, the people and their symptoms and, and how badly they get the disease, like you can't tell by examination how much or how quickly the disease will work? Because I'm thinking right. now of a toxic, um, um, some kind of toxic infusion that is different from somebody to another person. Right, so I mean you do get a sense of, of how, how sick they are by their functionality. So if they're really weak, if their breathing isn't very forceful, you, you know they have more severe disease than someone obviously who is stronger. But I can't tell you how fast that disease is going to necessarily progress, in a, in a, at least in a new patient. Mm -hmm. If there's been a patient that's had it for a while and you can say, you know, they they started like this a year ago and now they're down here, mm -hmm. they're probably going to progress fairly quickly versus someone who may have just changed slightly. But if you have a patient that comes in de novo with a brand new diagnosis, it's really hard to figure out how quickly they're going to, going to change or, or how they're going to progress. So. You know, once again, that would be very nice from an imaging standpoint is having a definitive understanding of what's going on in the brain so you can come up with an overall burden of disease, if that makes sense. So if you could figure out how many areas of the brain are affected and how severely they are affected, then that would give you a better understanding of, of not only you know, how sick they are at this point, but maybe how they're, quickly they're going to progress to that next stage. Mm -hmm. So you're still looking at everything. So we're still looking at everything, and I, th I, I, and I think for, for this field, we still need to look at everything because there's still a lot of questions to be answered. And in order to get a fingerprint, right, in order to paint, a, a, you know, to paint this painting behind us, right, <laughs> it, it's not just one dot, it's not just one, one paintbrush, right, it's not just one color, it's multiple colors, it's multiple layers, and that's how I think we need to think about this disease too, is that to get a full capture of the disease process to build that quote fingerprint of disease, we need to use multiple imaging techniques to fully capture, you know, the, the full structure of the brain, the function of the brain, the chemistry of the brain. All these details go into how the brain operates. Okay. Uh, it, ALS is a disease, but it's, it's, it's not an organism. It's not an organism. It's a syndrome. It's, yeah, it's a syndrome, right? So ALS is not like a specific type of infection, it's not a specific virus, it's not a specific bacteria, it's not a specific cancer. It's, yeah, it's a syndrome, it's a clinical diagnosis. You can't image it, you only image its effects? Uh, so that's a good question. You can, you can image the effects on the brain, but once again, by imaging, by using this imaging we can understand the mechanisms, the potential mechanisms of disease. But I can't capture, you know, a specific structure that says that's, you know, this is what's causing ALS, but I can capture the, the processes of, of how that brain is affected, how it's altered. So that little mitochondrial thing right. is the one con conduit 
that's one po- it's one Rock. pathway through which the through which the disease happens. Operates. Yeah, exactly. What exactly does that do again? It's supposed to do? Oh, so the mitochondria is important for prov- providing energy to the cell. So basically it converts different types of chemicals and nutrients uh, and oxygen into providing energy for the cell to function. Sometimes. I'm not a doctor. This is pain here. It's not thinking, it's pain. I'm thinking...